A few weeks ago, a viewer asked me what I have in mind for the upcoming video number 100. Maybe announcing a new project or reporting on breakthrough research? Well, there is no such thing to report, but I still decided to make a video that is entirely different from the previous 99. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. The last 99 videos have one thing in common. They all cover some technical aspects, sometimes more general, sometimes more detailed, but always covering something about how to operate and control a model railroad. But I never made a video that talks about the underlying design philosophy or why I am doing these videos. So I decided to use video number 100 to catch up on that topic, telling you a little bit what keeps me going, how I tick, what ticks me off, and how the IOTT channel was created, which literally was by accident. I'd say, most of all, curiosity. I was never happy with just knowing that something worked. I always wanted to know how and why, and then possibly make it myself. I was probably in kindergarten when I used the stroller to explore Newton's laws by letting it roll down a driveway. And since there was a garage door at the lower end of the driveway, I also learned early on that two physical objects at the same time, in the same location, will cause problems. That point was really dri driven home by my mother, after she took care of my little sister, who was on voluntary passenger of the stroller during the experiment. Lesson learned, and a very valid one, directly applicable to trains on model railroad layouts. During the middle school years, I became increasingly fascinated with electronics and electromagnetism. I started to build my own electromagnetic switches, mainly two coils wound around a paper core and a 5mm iron rod as an anchor, which I tempered by letting it sit for a day or so in our wood stove. Some copper pieces served as contacts to make an SPDT relay, which then was used on my neighbor friend's model railroad layout to implement a read contact activated block signal system. That was around 1975 and years before the first digital command control systems became available. Around 10 years later I graduated from college with a degree in electrical engineering and joined a company located in the so-called Silicon Valley of Switzerland. This is the area that used to be famous for the Swiss watchmaking industry. But by the mid-80s, the industry was on a steep decline because of the competition from cheap and also very precise, mainly Japanese quartz watches. One of the emerging industries was robotics, which was a good fit because of the technically well-educated labor force in the area. I was, of course, fascinated by automation, so I joined a robotics startup. We built assembly machines that were rather advanced at the time. A few microns resolution on the movements and advanced features like real-time localization of parts based on image processing from a camera and the like. And we had our own main computing board, an Intel 8085 8-bit system, and we were in the process of developing a 16-bit CPU board based on the Motorola 68000. Sounds like heaven for a young engineer, and it was. The economic side, on the other hand, was not that successful, and so it came that the startup was bought out by a larger company, and things changed. As a result of this process, I became more interested in the economic aspects of a business, and decided to join a master's program at a business school to learn everything about process management, organizational structures, quality, costing and the like. That was in the first half of the 90s and it was very timely because the initial ideas of computer integrated manufacturing had just failed and there was sort of a renewed focus on process management and business re-engineering. I really liked all these topics and long story short, ended up with a PhD in Management Science, 
with a PhD thesis combining all these things together, doing optimization of technical processes using activity-based costing to evaluate. While doing that, I always had the idea to stay on top of things in my original field, electrical engineering. So I basically ran my own EE company as a side activity and focused on software development. And that was the time when I became aware of some interesting developments in the model railroading field, mainly the introduction of the Morklin Digital Command Control System. That was the toy to bring all my interests together. Electronics, sensors, process control, software, everything I liked. So I bought some decoders, converted a few locomotives, bought a central unit and a computer interface and that was my start to digital model railroading. I also bought some Motorola chips the Morklin system was based on and built my own decoders and central unit, just because I wanted to know the details of the inner workings. That was around 1990 and just about the time when I became aware of a competing format for the signal sent to the rail, which was developed by Lenz on behalf of Marklin for the two rail system and for Arnold and Scale. The signal format was obviously superior to the Motorola signal for a variety of reasons and so I bought my first two rail locomotive and a lens decoder and another central unit to play with. There were two other developments in the early 90s that really helped me. Microsoft released Windows 3.1, which was the first Windows that I personally considered more than a toy. And Borland released Turbo Pascal 7, which for the first time brought Windows programming capability down to a reasonable price level. So, I investigated the possibilities to develop a Windows-based model railroad control software. At the time, this was something new, since all other available programs, mainly Softlock and Digipet, were only available for MS-DOS. And everybody I was talking to basically told me that it cannot be done with Windows because of timing and available computing resources. So I decided to accept the challenge and do it anyway. And so I released the first version of Windlock in the fall of 1992. About one year later I added support for Loconet and for several years Windlock was the only software that supported the Digitrack system. During that time I also did the PR1 for Windows, which was a freeware for decoder programming that was bundled with the Digitrax PR1 programmer. One important feature of Winlog 1.5 was that it supported pretty much all of the digital command control systems on the market at that time. And on top it had the capability to run several different systems at the same time. For Swiss modelers it was quite common to have a 3-rail mainline using Marklin and then a 2-rail narrow gauge line running on a lens system. Winlock allowed for controlling locomotives and turnouts of both systems on the same screen. This feature turned out to be an important element in a lawsuit against JMRI later. I will tell you that story in just a minute. In 1997 my wife and I moved from Switzerland to Atlanta. I kept working on the software and released version 2.1 in 1998. This was the version that was used to run the training layout at the Putra facility, the metro system of Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. You can find a nice case study about that project on the Digitrax webpage. You probably now wonder, where is Winlock today? Well, I let it die. There were several reasons for that. On the technical side, Borland Pascal was replaced by Delphi. I never really liked the Delphi IDE, but more importantly, several of the used libraries needed significant efforts to make them work again, so coming up with a new version was a major endeavor. And more importantly, we now had a family of four and I was already traveling a lot for my management consulting business, so I was simply running out of time to do everything. And doing things only half-baked 
never was my approach, so I finally decided to drop Winlog and shut down Digitoy Systems. I don't even remember, but that must have been sometimes around 2007 or so. So, curiosity has brought me a long way, but it always came with the problem of not having enough time for doing everything I was interested in. Well, I guess that is better than the other way around. After getting my PhD, I joined a management consulting company, first as a consultant in Switzerland and Germany, and after our move to Atlanta, as the founder and CEO of the US subsidiary. The focus of our work was on product structuring and modularization, as well as in process reengineering and automation. So, modular product design became one of my areas of expertise over time. Modularization means designing a product in a way that the functionality is grouped into individual modules that then can be combined in various ways to ever new products. Similar to LEGO, where a limited set of different bricks let you build all kinds of things. A more industrial example would be creating a 9V power supply and then make sure all products can be supplied with 9V so that the power supply module can be used with all of them. The advantages are obvious. The power supply can now be made in much greater numbers and the costs per piece are lower. Another advantage is that one can make improvements to one particular module without making changes to all products that use the module, even though they benefit from the improvement. The potential disadvantage is of course that the interface between the power supply and each device must be the same, 9 volts and a defined connector in the example. And this definition should remain stable over the lifetime of the module. Over the years I have been involved in projects to modularize all kinds of products, from small devices like voice over IP telephone stations or insulin pumps, to industrial devices like injection molders and other production equipment, to large-scale equipment like the auxiliary block of a thermonuclear power plant or the electric drive system of a freight train locomotive and of course a lot of work related to platform concepts in the automotive industry. Modular thinking can have advantages in many areas, but there is one area that is almost crying for a modular approach, and that is Model Railroad Digital Command Control Systems, and so it really became my design guideline for the devices I show on the IOTT channel. In a nutshell, a digital command control system consists of two module families, one on train level and one on the control system level. The train module family consists of a DCC waveform generator and a series of receivers or decoders, either stationary or mobile. Between the modules is a defined interface with electrical, mechanical and logical definition, which is the standardized DCC signal and the track geometry. The control module system is similar, but slightly more complex as there is more diversity of modules. But at the core there are input modules, for example track side sensors like block detectors, output modules like activators for relays or other animated objects, user interface modules like throttles, CTC panels, etc., and logical function modules, so elements that provide some sort of train control related calculations, for example a signaling system. And then there is the interface between the modules, which is the layout control bus or network with its electrical and logical characteristics. And the command station is basically the bridge between those two module systems so that input on the control side is converted to DCC signals on the train side. It's that simple. And with that, the dominant philosophy behind what I am doing on the IOTT channel is simply defining modules that make sense from a model railroader point of view and then design and implement them. 
That's what I'm having a lot of fun with on the IOTT channel. And if you want to participate, it is a good idea to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon so that you will be in the loop when new videos come out. One of the questions I hear once in a while is, why do you make everything open source? Why do you not protect the developments like other manufacturers do? There are two answers. First, it does not really matter as long as open source is limited to non-commercial use. I think I have a pretty good idea about who is using my designs to build products on their own, because most of the time I hear from them. Sometimes I get thank you notes, sometimes I get comments, and sometimes just questions because people got stuck somewhere in the process rebuilding my devices. I welcome all that feedback as it helps to improve my designs. For the majority of the viewers, however, building the products themselves is not the best option, maybe because they do not have the needed equipment or would not know how to do the debugging in case there is a problem. So they are better off just buying them from the Tindy store. Putting everything to open source is therefore a method that creates goodwill and supports a desirable image without really hurting on the economic side. The second reason for making everything public, however, is that it is available for every model railroader because nobody can later claim the technologies I introduce as their own intellectual property. And unfortunately, with the US patent process, this happens quite a lot, even in the model railroad industry. Maybe one of the better known cases is Jacobson vs. Katzer. It even has its own page on Wikipedia. Here's the story. Matt Katzer, a former Intel executive and later independent IT consultant, developed a middleware called Train Server and applied for several patents for some features of the software, mainly the capability to talk to several digital command control systems at the same time. If I remember right, I met him during the 2001 DCC Working Group meeting in St. Louis, where he tried to become friends with everybody and handed out booklets and CDs with the API documentation of his software. Well, just a few weeks later, I heard from his lawyers, who sent me a cease and desist letter trying to stop me selling the Winlog software. And then, some time later, he sued Bob Jacobson, the founder of the JMRI project, for infringements of his patents and a $200,000 compensation for unpaid license fees. It took almost four years to process the case through the courts and it ended with Katzer paying $100,000 to Jacobson because Katzer's patent could not be upheld. Guess why? Not exclusively, but in large parts thanks to prior art demonstrated in my Winlog software, which had the capabilities Katzer claimed to be his own innovations already six or seven years prior to his patent application. Katzer clearly should have known that, but he tried it anyway. Luckily, it did not work out in this case. Now, as mentioned, I am not a big fan of the patent process in its entirety, and most patents I see are in the best case slight adjustments to something that already exists. In my experience, a company is also better off to not spend a lot of money for getting patents, but do more to have a faster innovation cycle. Now, I don't claim my stuff is all that innovative, but that was the same situation with Winlock. And since it is possible to get a patent just for applying a known technology to a new field or industry, there is some potential for a creative lawyer. So with my videos and products, I just make sure everything is in the public domain and free to use for everybody in the long run. So that's basically what drives me, how I tick and what ticks me off. But why would I then create a YouTube channel? And why did I even get back into model railroading after stopping my activities and closing down Digitoy systems? Well, here is the story. 
I kept doing my international consulting work until 2011. Then I was presented an opportunity I simply could not let pass starting up a new production facility from ground up for one of my clients. So I joined that company, sold the consulting business and then we moved as a family to Santiago, Chile, where the production location was going to be. Quite an experience, new culture, new language, new location, new everything. I found and leased a new facility, hired the first employees, did all the factory planning, ordered injection molding equipment, dealt with thousands of problems and had a lot of fun. A little more than two years later the plant had five injection molders, around 30 employees, a three-shift operation and roughly 10 million dollars annual output. As a family we really enjoyed living in Chile and we traveled the entire country from Tierra del Fuego and Magellan Straits all the way up to the Atacama Desert and the Peruvian border. We also traveled to Argentina and Peru visiting Lima, Cusco, Machu Picchu and all these places. One thing that I started doing in Chile and enjoyed a lot was paragliding. I really liked hiking up somewhere in the Andes and then fly places. I started to fly in some competitions just for the fun of it and without any significant ambitions, but it was really cool. After moving back to the US in 2015, I kept doing that and had a lot of fun, either free flying or going out with my paramotor if there was no thermal lift to keep me up. I kept going places, took my glider to Europe and the Alps and several times to places in Colombia, which probably is my favorite country in South America. In 2018, during a vacation flying trip to Medellin, Colombia, I unfortunately had a serious accident. I flew into some turbulences and had a wing collapse close to the ground, so I crashed from an altitude of about 30 feet with very little drag from the wing. I hit the ground slightly to the side, so the protective equipment was only partially e effective. What helped on the other hand was that I landed on a small pile of cow manure, which may have saved my life. I was rushed to the hospital where they diagnosed several broken ribs, broken ankle and most importantly three broken vertebrae. Two of them were just cracked but L5 in the lower back was in thousand pieces and as we found out later was causing some spinal cord injuries. It took two or three days until I was stable enough so they could perform surgery to replace the L5 mess by some titanium rods and other hardware. I had two surgeries for that, both of them longer than 10 hours and I flatlined and had to be reanimated twice in the process. Tough times, but for me it was also a deeply spiritual experience. I have been a Christian for quite a while, but faith for sure is of most value in difficult life situations like this one. Knowing about the risks of the scheduled surgeries, I said goodbye to my wife and thanked her for the many wonderful years we had together and trusted that my life was in God's hand, whatever the outcome. Long story short, it obviously was not time yet to leave the planet and roughly a month after the accident, I was rolled out of the hospital in a wheelchair. Back home I started to adjust to my new life. With the remaining leg muscles still under my control, along with hours of physical therapy, I was able to walk again, even walking up and down stairs, but with, of course with significant limitations. And no running, no flying anymore, working to some degree, but not five days a week. So I considered my options and going back into model railroad control seemed to be an attractive one. Over the years IoT, the Internet of Things, really took off and there were plenty of new possibilities using microcontrollers and sensors that were not yet used on model railroads. I started to work on the MQTT gateway and then decided to publish a video about it. That was the beginning of the IOTT channel back in August 2018 and as they say the rest is history. So. 
That's the background story and if you are still watching, I assume you enjoyed it. As always, don't hesitate to click the like button to let me know. It helps to promote this video and the ILTT channel in general. And that's it for video number 100. Thanks for watching and see you in the next video.